Welcome to this compilation of short stories written by some of the great women sci-fi writers. In this video I'll be narrating The Vilbar Party by Evelyn E. Smith, Pictures Don't Lie by Catherine McLean, Zaritsky's Law by Anne Warren Griffith, An Empty Bottle by Mary Wolf, and Rebuttal by Betsy Curtis. If you find yourself enjoying the stories, consider checking out my Patreon for exclusive novelettes by all the great authors and early access to full novels I narrate. Head to patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff, the link is in the description. Now let's get to the stories, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. The Vilbar Party by Evelyn E. Smith Narrated by William Skye Nuts to you, was what gnarly new Earthman would tell him. Only it was Frismill nuts. The Persils are giving a Vilbar party tomorrow night, Professor Slude said cajolingly. You will come this time, won't you, Gnarly? Gnarly Xan rubbed his forehead fretfully. You know how I feel about parties, Khan. He took a Frismill nut out of the tray on his desk and nibbled it in annoyance. But this is in your honour, Gnarly, a farewell party. You must go. It would be... it would be unthinkable if you didn't. Khan Slude's eyes were pleading. He could not possibly be held responsible for his friend's antisocial behaviour, and yet, Gnarly knew, he would somehow feel at fault. Gnarly sighed. He supposed he would have to conform to public sentiment in this particular instance, but he was damned if he would give in gracefully. After all, what's so special about the occasion? I'm just leaving to take another teaching job, that's all. He took another nut. That's all? Slude's face swelled with emotion. You can't really be that indifferent. Another job, that's all it is to me, Gnarly persisted. At an exceptionally high salary, of course, or I wouldn't dream of accepting a position so inconveniently located. Slude was baffled and hurt and outraged. You have been honoured by being the first of our people to be offered an exchange professorship on another planet, he said stiffly. And you call it just another job? Why, I would have given my right antenna to get it. Gnarly realised that he had again overstepped the invisible boundary between candour and tactlessness. He poked at the nuts with a stylus. Honoured by being the first of our species to be offered a guinea pig ship, he murmured. He had not considered this aspect of the matter before, but now that it occurred to him, he was probably right. Oh, I don't mind really, he waved away the other's sudden commiseration. You know I like being alone most of the time, so I won't find that uncomfortable. Students are students, whether they're terrestrials or Saturnians. I suppose they'll laugh at me behind my back. But then even here my students always did that. He gave a hollow laugh and unobtrusively put out one of his hands for a nut. At least on earth I'll know why they're laughing. There was pain on Slude's expressive face as he firmly removed the nut tray from his friend's reach. I didn't think of it from that angle, Gnarly. Of course you're right. Human beings, from what I've read of them, are not noted for tolerance. It will be difficult, but I'm sure you'll be able to, he choked on the kindly lie, win them over. Gnarly repressed a bitter laugh. Anyone less likely than he to win over a hostile alien species through sheer personal charm could hardly be found on Saturn. Gnarly Xan had been chosen as first exchange professor between Saturn and Earth because of his academic reputation, not his personality. But although the choosers had probably not had that aspect of the matter in mind, the choice, he thought, was a wise one. As an individual of solitary habits, he was not apt to be much lonelier on one planet than another. And he had accepted the post largely because he felt that, as an alien being, he would be left strictly alone. This would give him the chance to put in a lot of work on his definitive history of the solar system a monumental project from which he begrudged all the time he had to spend in fulfilling even the minimum obligations expected of a professor on sociable Saturn. The salary was a weighty factor too. Not only was it more than twice what he had been getting, 
but since there would be no necessity for spending more than enough for bare subsistence, he would be able to save up a considerable amount and retire while still comparatively young. It was pleasant to imagine a scholarly life unafflicted by students. He could put up with a good deal for that goal. But how could he alleviate the distress he saw on Khan's face? He did not consciously want to hurt the only person who, for some strange reason, seemed to be fond of him, so he said the only thing he could think of to please. All right, Khan, I'll go to the Persils tomorrow night. It would be a deadly bore, parties always were, and he would eat too much, but after all the thought that it would be a long time before he'd see any of his own kind again would make the affair almost endurable. And just this once it would be all right for him to eat as much as he wanted. When he was on earth out of reach of decent food, he would probably trim down considerably. I just know you're going to love Earth, Professor Xan, the hostess on the interplanetary liner gushed. I'm sure I shall, he lied politely. She smiled at him too much, overdoing her professional cordiality. Underneath the effusiveness he sensed the repulsion. Of course he couldn't blame her for trying not to show her distaste for the strange creature. The effort at concealment was, as a matter of fact, more than he had expected from a terrestrial. But he wished she would leave him alone to meditate. He had planned to get a lot of meditation done on the journey. "'You speak awfully good English,' she told him. He looked at her. "'I am said to have some scholarly aptitude. I understand that's why I was chosen as an exchange professor. It does seem reasonable, doesn't it?' She turned pink a sign of embarrassment with these creatures he had learned. I didn't mean to, to question your ability, Professor. It's just that, well, you don't look like a professor. Indeed, he said frostily. And what do I look like, then? She turned even rosier. Oh, I, I don't know exactly. It's just that, well... And she fled. He couldn't resist flicking his antennae forward to catch her sotto voce conversation with the co-pilot. It was so seldom you got the chance to learn what others were saying about you behind your back. But I could hardly tell him he looks like a teddy bear, could I? He probably doesn't even know what a teddy bear is. Perhaps I don't, Gnarly thought resentfully, but I can guess. With low cunning the terrestrial seemed to have ferreted out the identity of all his favourite dishes, and kept serving them to him incessantly. By the time the ship made planetfall on Earth, he had gained ten grisbuts. Oh well, he thought. I suppose it's all just part of the regular diplomatic service. On Earth I'll have to eat crude native foods, so I'll lose all the weight again. President Purrington of North America came himself to meet Nali at the airfield, because Nali was the first interplanetary exchange professor in history. Welcome to our planet, Professor Xan, he said with warm diplomatic cordiality, wringing Nali's upper right hand after a moment of indecision. We shall do everything in our power to make your stay here a happy and memorable one. I wish you would begin by doing something about the climate, Nali thought. It was stupid of him not to have realized how hot it would be on Earth. He was really going to suffer in this torrid climate especially in the tight terrestrial costume he wore over his fur for the sake of conformity. Of course, justice compelled him to admit to himself, the clothes wouldn't have become so snug if he hadn't eaten quite so much on board ship. Purrington indicated the female beside him. May I introduce my wife? Oh, the female gasped. Isn't he cute? The president and Nali stared at her in consternation. She looked abashed for a moment, then smiled widely at Nali and the press photographers. "'Welcome to Earth, dear Professor Gizan!' she exclaimed, mispronouncing his name, of course. Bending down, she kissed him right upon his fuzzy forehead. Kissing was not a Saturnian practice, nor did Nali approve of it. However, he had read enough about Earth to know that Europeans sometimes greeted dignitaries in this particular way. Only this place, he had been given to understand, was not Europe, but America. "'I am having a cocktail party in your honour this afternoon,' she beamed, smoothing her flowered print dress down over her girdle. 
You'll be there at five sharp, won't you, dear? Delighted, he promised dismally. He could hardly plead a previous engagement a moment after arriving. I've tried to get all the things you like to eat, she went on anxiously. But you will tell me if there's anything special, won't you? I am on a diet, he said. He must be strong. Probably the food would be repulsive anyhow, so he'd have no difficulty controlling his appetite. Digestive disorders, you know. A glass of Vichy and a biscuit will be... He stopped, for there were tears in Mrs. Purrington's eyes. Your tummy hurts? Oh, you poor little darling! Gladys, the President said sharply. There were frizzmill nuts at Mrs. Purrington's cocktail party, and Vilbar, and even Slipness Brugs, all imported at fabulous expense, Gnarly knew. But then this was a government affair, and expense means nothing to a government, since, as far as it is concerned, money grows on taxpayers. Some of the native foods proved surprisingly palatable, too. Pâté de foie gras and champagne, and little puff pastries full of delightful surprises. Gnarly was afraid he was making a zlugal of himself. However, he thought, trying not to catch sight of his own portly person in the mirrors that walled the room, the lean days were just ahead. Besides, what could he do when everyone insisted on pressing food on him? Try this, Professor Xan. Do try that, Professor Xan. Doesn't he look cunning in his little dress suit? They crowded around him. The women cooed, the men beamed, and Gnarly ate. He would be glad when he could detach himself from all this cloying diplomacy and get back to the healthy rancour of the classroom. At school, the odour of chalk dust, ink, and rotting apple cores was enough like its Saturnian equivalent to make Gnarly feel at home immediately. The students would dislike him on sight, he knew. It is in the nature of the young to be hostile toward whatever is strange and alien. They would despise him and jeer at him, and he, in his turn, would give them long, involved homework assignments and such difficult examinations that they would fail. Gnarly waddled briskly up to his desk, which had, he saw, been scaled down to Saturnian size, whereas he had envisioned himself struggling triumphantly with ordinary earth-sized furniture. But the atmosphere was as hot and sticky and intolerable as he had expected. Panting as unobtrusively as possible, he rapped with his pointer. Attention, students! Now should come the derisive babble. But there was a respectful silence broken suddenly by a shrill feminine whisper of, "'Oh, he's so adorable!' followed by the harsh, "'Shh, Ava! You'll embarrass the poor little thing!' Gnarly's face swelled. "'I am your new professor of Saturnian studies. Saturn, as you probably know, is a major planet. It is much larger and more important than Earth, which is only a minor planet.' The students obediently took this down in their notebooks. They carefully took down everything he said. Even a bout of coughing that afflicted him halfway through seemed to be getting a phonetic transcription. From time to time they would interrupt his lecture with questions so pertinent, so well thought out and so courteous, that all he could do was answer them. His antennae lifted to catch the whispers that from time to time were exchanged between even the best behaved of the students. Isn't he precious? Seems like a nice fellow, sound grasp of his subject. Sweet little thing. Unusually interesting presentation. Doesn't he remind you of Winnie the Pooh? Able chap. Just darling. After class, instead of rushing out of the room, they hovered around his desk with intelligent, solicitous questions. Did he like Earth? Was his desk too high, too low? Didn't he find it hot with all that fur? Such lovely, soft, fluffy fur, though. Do you mind if I stroke one of your paws, hands, Professor? So cuddly looking. He said yes, as a matter of fact he was hot, and no, he didn't mind being touched in a spirit of scientific investigation. He had a moment of uplift at the teacher's cafeteria when he discovered lunch to be virtually inedible. The manager, however, had been distressed to see him pick at his food, and by dinner time, a distinguished chef with an expert knowledge of Saturnian cuisine had been rushed from Washington. Since the school food was inedible for all intelligent life forms, everyone ate the Saturnian dishes and praised Gnarly as a public benefactor. 
That night, alone in the quiet confines of his small room at the men's faculty club, Nali had spread out his notes and was about to start work on his history, when there was a knock at the door. He trotted over to open it, grumbling to himself. The head of his department smiled brightly down at him. Some of us are going out for a couple of drinks and a gab fest. Care to come along? Nali did not see how he could refuse and still carry the Saturnian's burden, so he accepted. Discovering that gin fizzes and Alexander's were even more palatable than champagne and more potent than Vilbar, he told several Saturnine locker room stories which were hailed with loud merriment. But he was being laughed at, not with, he knew. All this false cordiality, he assured himself, would die down after a couple of days, and then he would be able to get back to work. He must curb his intellectual impatience. In the morning, he found that enrolment in his classes had doubled, and the room was crowded to capacity with the bright, shining, eager faces of young terrestrials athirst for learning. There were apples, chocolates, and imported frismill nuts on his desk, as well as a pressing invitation from Mrs. Purrington for him to spend all his weekends and holidays at the White House. The window was fitted with an air conditioning unit, which he later discovered his classes had chipped in to buy for him, and the temperature had been lowered to a point where it was almost comfortable. All the students wore coats. When he went out on the campus, women, students, teachers, even strangers stopped to talk to him, to exclaim over him, to touch him, even to kiss him. Photographers were perpetually taking pictures, some of which turned up in the student union as full-colour postcards. They sold like Lajel out of season. Gnarly wrote in Saturnian on the back of one, Having miserable time, be glad you're not here, and sent it to Slude. There were cocktail parties, musicals, and balls in Gnarly's honour. When he tried to refuse an invitation, he was accused of shyness and virtually dragged to the affair by laughing members of the faculty. He put on so much weight that he had to buy a complete new terrestrial outfit, which set him back a pretty penny. As a result, he had to augment his income by lecturing to women's clubs. They slobbered appallingly. Gnarly's students did all their homework assiduously, and in fact put in more work than had been assigned. At the end of the year, not only did all of them pass, but with flying colours. "'I hope you'll remember, Professor Xan,' the president of the university said, "'that there will always be a job waiting for you here, a non-exchange professorship. Love to have you.' "'Thank you,' Nali replied politely. Mrs. Purrington broke into loud sobs when he told her he was leaving the earth. "'Oh, I'll miss you so, Nali. You will write, won't you?' Yes, of course, he said grimly. That made 218 people to whom he'd had to promise to write. It was fortunate he was travelling as a guest of the North American government, he thought, as he supervised the loading of his matched interplanetary luggage, his eight steamer baskets, his leather-bound Encyclopedia Terrestria with his name imprinted in gold on each volume, his Indian war bonnet, his oil painting of the President, and his six cases of champagne all parting gifts, onto the liner. Otherwise the fee for excess luggage would take what little remained of his bank account. There had been so many expenses, clothes and hostess gifts and ice. Not all his mementos were in his luggage. A new rare metal watch gleamed on each of his four furry wrists. A brand new trobskin wallet, platinum keychain and uranium fountain pen were in his pocket and a diamond and curium bauble clasped a tie, lovingly hand-painted by a female student. The argyles on his fuzzy ankles had been knitted by another. Still another devoted pupil had presented him with a hand-woven plastic case full of frismill nuts to eat on the way back. "'Well, Gnarly,' Slude said, his face swelling with joy. "'Well, well, you've put on weight, I see.' Gnarly dropped into his old chair with a sigh. Slude might have picked something else to comment on first, his haggardness, for instance, or the increased spirituality of his expression. "'Nothing else to do on earth in your leisure moments but eat, I suppose,' Slude said, pushing over the nut tray. "'Even their food. Have some frismills.' "'No, thank you,' Gnarly replied coldly. Slude looked at him in distress. 
Oh, how you must have suffered! Was it very, very bad, Gnarly? Gnarly hunched low in his chair. It was just awful. I'm sure they didn't mean to be unkind, Slude assured him. Naturally, you are a strange creature to them, and they're only unkind. Gnarly gave a bitter laugh. They practically killed me with kindness. It was fuss, fuss, fuss all the time. Now, Gnarly, I do wish you wouldn't be quite so sarcastic. I'm not being sarcastic, and I wasn't a strange creature to them. It seems there's a sort of popular child's toy on Earth known as a, he winced, teddy bear. I aroused pleasant childhood memories in them, so they showered me with affection and edibles. Slood closed his eyes in anguish. You are very brave, Gnarly, he said almost reverently. Very brave and wise and good. Certainly that would be the best thing to tell our people. After all, the terrestrials are our allies. We don't want to stir up public sentiment against them. But you can be honest with me, Gnarly. Did they refuse to serve you in restaurants? Were you segregated in public vehicles? Did they shrink from you when you came close? Gnarly beat the desk with all four hands. I was hardly ever given the chance to be alone. They crawled all over me. Restaurants begged for my trade. I had to hire private vehicles because in public ones I was mobbed by admirers. Such a short time, Sloot murmured, and already suspicious of even me, your oldest friend. But don't talk about it if you don't want to, Gnarly. Tell me, though, did they sneer at you and whisper half-audible insults? Did they— You're right, Gnarly snapped. I don't want to talk about it. Slood placed a comforting hand upon his shoulder. Perhaps that's wisest, until the shock of your experience has worn off. Gnarly made an irritable noise. The Persils are giving a Vilbar party tonight, Slood said. But I know how you feel about parties. I've told them you're exhausted from your trip and won't be able to make it. Oh, you did, did you? Gnarly asked ironically. What makes you think you know how I feel about parties? But there's an interesting saying on earth. Travel is so broadening. He looked down at his bulges with tolerant amusement. In more way than one, in case the meaning eludes you. Very sound psychologically. I've discovered that I like parties. I like being liked. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to inform the Persils that I shall be delighted to come to their party. Care to join me? Well, Slood mumbled, I'd like to, but I have so much work. Introvert, said Gnarly, and he began dialing the Persils. Pictures Don't Lie by Catherine McLean Narrated by William Skye Pictures, that is, that one can test and measure, and these pictures positively, absolutely could not lie. The man from the news asked, What do you think of the aliens, Mr. Nathan? Are they friendly? Do they look human? Very human, said the thin young man. Outside, rain sleeted across the big windows with a steady, faint drumming, blurring and dimming the view of the airfield where they would arrive. On the concrete runways, the puddles were pockmarked with rain, and the grass growing untouched between the runways of the unused field glistened wetly, bending before gusts of wind. Back at a respectful distance from where the huge spaceship would land were the grey shapes of trucks, where TV camera crews huddled inside their mobile units, waiting. Farther back in the deserted sandy landscape, behind distant sandy hills, artillery was ringed in a great circle, and in the distance across the horizon, bombers stood ready at airfields, guarding the world against possible treachery from the first alien ship ever to land from space. "'Do you know anything about their home planet?' asked the man from the Herald. The Times man stood with the others, listening absently, thinking of questions but reserving them. Joseph R. Nathan, the thin young man with the straight black hair and the tired lines on his face, was being treated with respect by his interviewers. He was obviously on edge, 
and they did not want to harry him with too many questions to answer at once. They wanted to keep his good will. Tomorrow he would be one of the biggest celebrities ever to appear in headlines. No, nothing directly. Any ideas or deductions? Harold persisted. Their world must be Earth-like to them, the weary-looking young man answered uncertainly. The environment evolves the animal, but only in relative terms, of course. He looked at them with a quick glance and then looked away evasively, his lank black hair beginning to cling to his forehead with sweat. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. Earth-like, muttered a reporter, writing it down as if he had noticed nothing more in the reply. The Times-man glanced at the Herald, wondering if he had noticed, and received a quick glance in exchange. The Herald asked Nathan, "'You think they are dangerous, then?' It was the kind of question, assuming much, which usually broke reticence and brought forth quick facts when it hit the mark. They all knew of the military precautions, although they were not supposed to know. The question missed. Nathan glanced out the window vaguely. No, I wouldn't say so. You think they are friendly, then? said the herald, equally positive on the opposite tack. A fleeting smile touched Nathan's lips. Those I know are. There was no lead in this direction, and they had to get the basic facts of the story before the ship came. The Times asked, What led up to your contacting them? Nathan answered after a hesitation. Static. Radio static. The army told you my job, didn't they? The army had told them nothing at all. The officer who had conducted them in for the interview stood glowering watchfully, as if he objected by instinct to telling anything to the public. Nathan glanced at him doubtfully. My job is radio decoder for the Department of Military Intelligence. I use a directional pickup, tune in on foreign bands record any scrambled or coded messages I hear, and build automatic decoders and descramblers for all the basic scramble patterns. The officer cleared his throat, but said nothing. The reporters smiled, noting that down. Security regulations had changed since arms inspection had been legalized by the UN. Complete information being the only public security against secret rearmament, spying and prying, had come to seem a public service. Its aura had changed. It was good public relations to admit to it. Nathan continued. I started directing the pickup at Stars in my spare time. There's radio noise from Stars, you know. Just stuff that sounds like spatter static and an occasional squawk. People have been listening to it for a long time and researching, trying to work out why stellar radiation on those bands comes in such jagged bursts. It didn't seem natural. He paused and smiled uncertainly, aware that the next thing he would say was the thing that would make him famous, an idea that had come to him while he listened, an idea as simple and as perfect as the one that came to Newton when he saw the apple fall. I decided it wasn't natural. I tried decoding it. Hurriedly, he tried to explain it away and make it seem obvious. You see, there's an old intelligence trick, speeding up a message on a record until it sounds just like that, a short squawk of static, and then broadcasting it. Undergrounds use it. I'd heard that kind of screech before. You mean they broadcast at us in code? asked the news. It's not exactly code. All you need to do is record it and slow it down. They're not broadcasting at us. If a star has planets, inhabited planets, and there is broadcasting between them, they would send it on a tight beam to save power. He looked for comprehension. You know, like a spotlight. Theoretically, a tight beam can go on forever without losing power. But aiming would be difficult from planet to planet. You can't expect a beam to stay on target over such distances, more than a few seconds at a time. So they'd naturally compress each message into a short half-second or one-second length package, and send it a few hundred times in one long blast to make sure it is picked up during the instant the beam swings across the target. He was talking slowly and carefully, remembering that this explanation was for the newspapers. 
When a stray bean swings through our section of space, there's a sharp peak in noise level from that direction. The beams are swinging to follow their own planets at home, and the distance between there and here exaggerates the speed of swing tremendously, so we wouldn't pick up more than a bip as it passes. How do you account for the number of squawks coming in? The Times asked. Do stellar systems rotate on the plane of the galaxy? It was a private question. He spoke impulsively from interest and excitement. The radio decoder grinned, the lines of strain vanishing from his face for a moment. Maybe we're intercepting everybody's telephone calls, and the whole galaxy is swarming with races that spend all day yakking at each other over the radio. Maybe the human type is standard model. It would take something like that, the Times agreed. They smiled at each other. The news asked, How did you happen to pick up television instead of voices? Not by accident, Nathan explained patiently. I'd recognised a scanning pattern, and I wanted pictures. Pictures are understandable in any language. Near the interviewers, a senator paced back and forth, muttering his memorised speech of welcome, and nervously glancing out the wide streaming windows into the grey sleeting rain. Opposite the windows of the long room was a small raised platform flanked by the tall shapes of TV cameras and sound pickups on booms, and darkened floodlights arranged and ready for the senator to make his speech of welcome to the aliens and the world. A shabby radio sending set stood beside it without a case to conceal its parts, two cathode television tubes flickering nakedly on one side, and the speaker humming on the other. A vertical panel of dials and knobs jutted up before them, and a small hand mic sat ready on the table before the panel. It was connected to a box-like, expensively cased piece of equipment with Radio Lab U.S. Property stenciled on it. I recorded a couple of package screeches from Sagittarius and began working on them, Nathan added. It took a couple of months to find the synchronising signals and set scanners close enough to the right time to even get a pattern. When I showed the pattern to the department, they gave me full time to work on it and an assistant to help. It took eight months to pick out the colour bands and assign them the right colours to get anything intelligible on the screen. The shabby-looking mess of exposed parts was the original receiver that they had laboured over for ten months, adjusting and readjusting to reduce the maddening rippling plaids of unsynchronised colour scanners to some kind of sane picture. Trial and error, said Nathan, but it came out all right. The wide-band spread of the squawks had suggested colour TV from the beginning. He walked over and touched the set. The speaker bipped slightly, and the grey screen flickered with a flash of colour at the touch. The set was awake and sensitive, tuned to receive from the great interstellar spaceship which now circled the atmosphere. We wondered why there were so many bands, but when we got the set working and started recording and playing everything that came in, we found we'd tapped something like a lending library line. It was all fiction, plays. Between the pauses in Nathan's voice, the Times found himself unconsciously listening for the sound of roaring, swiftly approaching rocket jets. The Post asked, How did you contact the spaceship? I scanned and recorded a film copy of Rite of Spring, the Disney-Stravinsky combination, and send it back along the same line we were receiving from. Just testing. It wouldn't get there for a good number of years if it got there at all, but I thought it would please the library to get a new record in. Two weeks later, when we caught and slowed a new batch of recordings, we found an answer. It was obviously meant for us. It was a flash of the Disney being played to a large audience, and then the audience sitting and waiting before a blank screen. The signal was very clear and loud. We'd intercepted a spaceship. They were asking for an encore, you see. They liked the film and wanted more. He smiled at them in sudden thought. You can see them for yourself. It's all right down the hall where the linguists are working on the automatic translator. The listening officer frowned and cleared his throat, and the thin young man turned to him quickly. No security reason why they should not see the broadcasts, is there? Perhaps you should show them. 
he said to the reporters reassuringly. It's right down the hall. You will be informed the moment the spaceship approaches. The interview was very definitely over. The lank-haired, nervous young man turned away and seated himself at the radio set while the officer swallowed his objections and showed them dourly down the hall to a closed door. They opened it and fumbled into a darkened room crowded with empty folding chairs dominated by a glowing bright screen. The door closed behind them, bringing total darkness. There was the sound of reporters fumbling their way into seats around him, but the Times man remained standing, aware of an enormous surprise, as if he had been asleep and wakened to find himself in the wrong country. The bright colours of the double image seemed the only real thing in the darkened room. Even blurred as they were, he could see that the action was subtly different, the shape subtly not right. He was looking at aliens. The impression was of two humans disguised, humans moving oddly, half dancing, half crippled. Carefully, afraid the images would go away, he reached up to his breast pocket, took out his polarised glasses, rotated one lens at right angles to the other, and put them on. Immediately the two beings came into sharp focus, real and solid, and the screen became a wide, elusively near window through which he watched them. They were conversing with each other in a grey-walled room, discussing something with restrained excitement. The large man in the green tunic closed his purple eyes for an instant at something the other said, and grimaced, making a motion with his fingers as if shoving something away from him. Melodrama. The second, smaller, with yellowish-green eyes, stepped closer, talking more rapidly in a lower voice. The first stood very still, not trying to interrupt. Obviously the proposal was some advantageous treachery, and he wanted to be persuaded. The Times groped for a chair and sat down. Perhaps gesture is universal. Desire and aversion, a leaning forward or a leaning back, tension, relaxation. Perhaps these actors were masters. The scenes changed. A corridor, a park-like place in what he began to realise was a spaceship, a lecture room. There were others talking and working, speaking to the man in the green tunic, and never was it unclear what was happening or how they felt. They talked a flowing language with many short vowels and shifts of pitch, and they gestured in the heat of talk, their hands moving with an odd lagging difference of motion, not slow, but somehow drifting. He ignored the language, but after a time the difference in motion began to arouse his interest. Something in the way they walked. With an effort, he pulled his mind from the plot and forced his attention to the physical difference. Brown hair and short silky crew cuts, varied eye colours, the colours showing clearly because their irises were very large, their round eyes set very widely apart in tapering light brown faces. Their neck and shoulders were thick in a way that would indicate unusual strength for a human, but their wrists were narrow and their fingers long and thin and delicate. There seemed to be more than the usual number of fingers. Since he came in, a machine had been whirring and a voice muttering beside him. He called his attention from counting their fingers and looked around. Beside him sat an alert-looking man wearing earphones, watching and listening with hawk-like concentration. Beside him was a tall streamlined box. From the screen came the sound of the alien language. The man abruptly flipped a switch on the box, muttered a word into a small hand microphone, and flipped the switch back with nervous rapidity. He reminded the Times man of the earphoned interpreters at the UN. The machine was probably a vocal translator, and the mutterer a linguist adding to its vocabulary. Near the screen were two other linguists taking notes. The Times remembered the senator pacing in the observatory room, rehearsing his speech of welcome. The speech would not be just the empty, pompous gesture he had expected. It would be translated mechanically and understood by the aliens. On the other side of the glowing window that was the stereo screen, the large protagonist in the green tunic was speaking to a pilot in a grey uniform. 
They stood in a brightly lit canary yellow control room in a spaceship. The Times tried to pick up the thread of the plot. Already he was interested in the fate of the hero and liked him. That was the effect of good acting, probably, for part of the art of acting is to win affection from the audience, and this actor might be the matinee idol of whole solar systems. Controlled tension, betraying itself by a jerk of the hands, a too quick answer to a question. The uniformed one, not suspicious, turned his back, busying himself at some task involving a map lit with glowing red points, his motions sharing the same fluid dragging grace of the others, as if they were underwater or on a slow-motion film. The other was watching a switch, a switch set into a panel, moving closer to it, talking casually, background music coming and rising in thin chords of tension. There was a close-up of the alien's face watching the switch, and the Times noted that his ears were symmetrically half-circles, almost perfect, with no ear holes visible. The voice of the uniformed one answered, a brief word in a preoccupied deep voice. His back was still turned. The other glanced at the switch, moving closer to it, talking casually, the switch coming closer and closer stereoscopically. It was in reach, filling the screen. His hand came into view, darting out, closed over the switch. There was a sharp clap of sound, and his hand opened in a frozen shape of pain. Beyond him, as his gaze swung up, stood the figure of the uniformed officer, unmoving, a weapon rigid in his hand, in the startled position in which he had turned and fired, watching with widening eyes as the man in the green tunic swayed and fell. The tableau held, the uniformed one drooping, looking down at his hand holding the weapon which had killed, and music began to build in from the background. Just for an instant, the room and the things within it flashed into one of those bewildering colour changes which were the bane of colour television, and switched to a colour negative of itself, a green man standing in a violet control room, looking down at the body of a green man in a red tunic. It held for less than a second, then the colour band alternator fell back into phase, and the colours reversed to normal. Another uniformed man came and took the weapon from the limp hand of the other, who began to explain dejectedly in a low voice while the music mounted and covered his words, and the screen slowly went blank, like a window that slowly filmed over with grey fog. The music faded. In the dark, someone clapped appreciatively. The earphoned man beside the times shifted his earphones back from his ears and spoke briskly. I can't get any more. Either of you want a replay? There was a short silence until the linguist nearest the set said, I guess we've squeezed that one dry. Let's run the tape where Nathan and that ship radio boy are kidding around CQing and turning their beams in closer. I have a hunch the boy is talking routine ham talk and giving the old radio count, one, two, three, testing. There was some fumbling in the semi-dark, and then the screen came to life again. It showed a flash of an audience sitting before a screen, and gave a clipped chord of some familiar symphony. "'Crazy about Stravinsky and Mozart,' remarked the earphone linguist to the Times, resettling his earphones. "'Can't stand Gershwin. Can you beat that?' He turned his attention back to the screen as the right sequence came on. The post, who was sitting just in front of him, turned to the Times and said, "'Funny how much they look like people.' He was writing, making notes to telephone his report. "'What colour hair did that character have?' "'I didn't notice.' He wondered if he should remind the reporter that Nathan had said he assigned the colour bands on guess choosing the colours that gave the most plausible images. The guests, when they arrived, could turn out to be bright green with blue hair. Only the gradations of colour in the picture were sure, only the similarities and contrasts, the relationship of one colour to another. From the screen came the sound of the alien language again. This race averaged deeper voices than human. He liked deep voices. Could he write that? No, there was something wrong with that, too. How had Nathan established the right soundtrack pitch? Was it a matter of taking the modulation as it came in, or some sort of heterodyning up and down by trial and error? Probably. 
It might be safer to assume that Nathan had simply preferred deep voices. As he sat there, doubting, an uneasiness he had seen in Nathan came back to add to his own uncertainty, and he remembered just how close that uneasiness had come to something that looked like restrained fear. What I don't get is why he went to all the trouble of picking up TV shows instead of just contacting them, the news complained. They're good shows, but what's the point? Maybe so we'd get to learn their language too, said the Herald. On the screen now was the obviously unstaged and genuine scene of a young alien working over a bank of apparatus. He turned and waved and opened his mouth in the comical O shape, which the Times was beginning to recognise as their equivalent of a smile, then went back to trying to explain something about the equipment in elaborate awkward gestures and carefully mouthed words. The Times got up quietly, went out into the bright white stone corridor, and walked back the way he had come, thoughtfully folding his stereo glasses and putting them away. No one stopped him. Secrecy restrictions were ambiguous here. The reticence of the army seemed more a matter of habit, mere reflex from the fact that it had all originated in the intelligence department, than any reasoned policy of keeping the landing a secret. The main room was more crowded than he had left it. The TV camera and sound crew stood near their apparatus, the senator had found a chair and was reading, and at the far end of the room eight men were grouped in a circle of chairs, arguing something with impassioned concentration. The Times recognised a few he knew personally, eminent names in science, workers in field theory. A stray phrase reached him. Reference to the universal constants as ratio— it was probably a discussion of ways of converting formulas from one mathematics to another for a rapid exchange of information. They had reason to be intent, aware of the flood of insights that novel viewpoints could bring, if they could grasp them. He would have liked to go over and listen, but there was too little time left before the spaceship was due, and he had a question to ask. The hand-rigged transceiver was still humming, tuned to the sending band of the circling ship, and the young man who had started it all was sitting on the edge of the TV platform with his chin resting in one hand. He did not look up as the times approached, but it was the indifference of preoccupation, not discourtesy. The times sat down on the edge of the platform beside him and took out a pack of cigarettes, then remembered the coming TV broadcast and the ban on smoking. He put them away, thoughtfully watching the diminishing rain spray against the streaming windows. "'What's wrong?' he asked. Nathan showed that he was aware and friendly by a slight motion of his head. "'You tell me.' "'Hunch,' said the Times man. "'Sheer hunch. Everything's sailing along too smoothly. Everyone taking too much for granted.' Nathan relaxed slightly. I'm still listening. Something about the way they move. Nathan shifted to glance at him. That's bothered me, too. Are you sure they're adjusted to the right speed? Nathan clenched his hands out in front of him and looked at them consideringly. I don't know. When I turn the tape faster, they're all rushing, and you begin to wonder why their clothes don't stream behind them, why the doors close so quickly and yet you can't hear them slam, why things fall so fast. If I turn it slower, they all seem to be swimming. He gave the Times a considering sidewise glance. Didn't catch the name. Country-bred guy, thought the Times. Jacob Luke, Times, he said, extending his hand. Nathan gave the hand a quick, hard grip, identifying the name. Sunday Science Section Editor. I read it. Surprised to meet you here. Likewise, the Times smiled. Look, have you gone into this rationally with formulas? He found a pencil in his pocket. Obviously there's something wrong with our judgment of their weight-to-speed to momentum ratio. Maybe it's something simple like low gravity aboard ship with magnetic shoes. Maybe they are floating slightly. Why worry, Nathan cut in. I don't see any reason to try to figure it out now. He laughed and shoved back his black hair nervously. 
We'll see them in twenty minutes. Will we? asked the Times slowly. There was a silence while the senator turned a page of his magazine with a slight crackling of paper, and the scientists argued at the other end of the room. Nathan pushed at his lank black hair again, as if it were trying to fall forward in front of his eyes and keep him from seeing. Sure. The young man laughed suddenly, talked rapidly. Sure we'll see them. Why shouldn't we, with all the government ready with welcome speeches, the whole army turned out and hiding over the hill, reporters all around, newsreel cameras, everything set up to broadcast the landing to the world. The president himself shaking hands with me and waiting in Washington. He came to the truth without pausing for breath. He said, Hell no, they won't get here. There's some mistake somewhere. Something's wrong. I should have told the brass hats yesterday when I started adding it up. Don't know why I didn't say anything. Scared, I guess. Too much top rank around here. Lost my nerve. He clutched the Times man's sleeve. Look, I don't know what— A green light flashed on the sending-receiving set. Nathan didn't look at it, but he stopped talking. The loudspeaker on the set broke into a voice speaking in the alien's language. The senator started and looked nervously at it, straightening his tie. The voice stopped. Nathan turned and looked at the loudspeaker. His worry seemed to be gone. What is it? the Times asked anxiously. He says they've slowed enough to enter the atmosphere now. They'll be here in five to ten minutes, I guess. That's Bud. He's all excited. He says, holy smoke, what a murky-looking planet we live on. Nathan smiled. Kidding. The Times was puzzled. What does he mean, murky? It can't be raining over much territory on Earth. Outside the rain was slowing and bright blue patches of sky were shining through breaks in the cloud blanket, glittering blue light from the drops that ran down the windows. He tried to think of an explanation. Maybe they're trying to land on Venus. The thought was ridiculous, he knew. The spaceship was following Nathan's sending beam. It couldn't miss Earth. Bud had to be kidding. The green light glowed on the set again, and they stopped speaking, waiting for the message to be recorded, slowed, and replayed. The cathode screen came to life suddenly with a picture of the young man sitting at his sending set, his back turned, watching a screen at one side which showed a glimpse of a huge dark plane approaching. As the ship plunged down toward it, the illusion of solidity melted into a boiling turbulence of black clouds. They expanded in an inky swirl, looked huge for an instant, and then blackness swallowed the screen. The young alien swung around to face the camera, speaking a few words as he moved, made the O of a smile again, then flipped the switch and the screen went grey. Nathan's voice was suddenly toneless and strained. He said something like, Break out the drinks, here they come. The atmosphere doesn't look like that, the Times said at random, knowing he was saying something too obvious even to think about. Not Earth's atmosphere. Some people drifted up. What did they say? Entering the atmosphere. Ought to be landing in five or ten minutes, Nathan told them. A ripple of heightened excitement ran through the room. Cameramen began adjusting the lens angles again, turning on the mic and checking it, turning on the floodlights. The scientists rose and stood near the window, still talking. The reporters trooped in from the hall and went to the windows to watch for the great event. The three linguists came in, trundling a large wheeled box that was the mechanical translator, supervising while it was hitched into the sound broadcasting system. Landing where? the Times asked Nathan brutally. Why don't you do something? Tell me what to do and I'll do it, Nathan said quietly, not moving. It was not sarcasm. Jacob Luke of the Times looked sidewise at the strained whiteness of his face and moderated his tone. Can't you contact them? Not while they're landing. What now? The Times took out a pack of cigarette, remembered the rule against smoking, and put it back. We just wait. Nathan leaned his elbow on one knee and his chin in his hand. They waited. All the people in the room were waiting. There was no more conversation. 
A bald man of the scientist group was automatically buffing his fingernails over and over and inspecting them without seeing them. Another absently polished his glasses, held them up to the light, put them on, and then a moment later took them off and began polishing again. The television crew concentrated on their jobs, moving quietly and efficiently, with perfectionist care, minutely arranging things which did not need to be arranged, checking things that had already been checked. This was to be one of the great moments of human history, and they were all trying to forget that fact and remain impassive and wrapped up in the problems of their jobs as good specialists should. After an interminable age, the Times consulted his watch. Three minutes had passed. He tried holding his breath a moment, listening for a distant approaching thunder of jets. There was no sound. The sun came out from behind the clouds and lit up the field like a great spotlight on an empty stage. Abruptly, the green light shone on the set again, indicating that a squawk message had been received. The recorder recorded it, slowed it, and fed it back to the speaker. It clicked and the sound was very loud in the still, tense room. The screen remained grey, but Bud's voice spoke a few words in the alien language. He stopped, the speaker clicked, and the light went out. When it was plain that nothing more would occur and no announcement was to be made of what was said, the people in the room turned back to the windows. Talk picked up again. Somebody told a joke and laughed alone. One of the linguists remained turned toward the loudspeaker, then looked at the widening patches of blue sky showing out the window, his expression puzzled. He had understood. It's dark, the thin intelligence department decoder translated, low-voiced, to the man from the Times. Your atmosphere is thick. That's precisely what Bud said. Another three minutes. The Times caught himself about to light a cigarette and swore silently, blowing the match out and putting the cigarette back into its package. He listened for the sound of the rocket jets. It was time for the landing, yet he heard no blasts. The green light came on in the transceiver. Message in. Instinctively, he came to his feet. Nathan abruptly was standing beside him. Then the message came in the voice he was coming to think of as Bud. It spoke and paused. Suddenly the Times knew. We've landed, Nathan whispered the words. The wind blew across the open spaces of white concrete and damp soil that was the empty airfield, swaying the wet, shiny grass. The people in the room looked out, listening for the roar of jets, looking for the silver bulk of a spaceship in the sky. Nathan moved, seating himself at the transmitter, switching it on to warm up, checking and balancing dials. Jacob Luke of the Times moved softly to stand behind his right shoulder, hoping he could be useful. Nathan made a half motion of his head, as if to glance back at him, unhooked two of the earphone sets hanging on the side of the tall streamlined box that was the automatic translator, plugged them in, and handed one back over his shoulder to the Times man. The voice began to come from the speaker again. Hastily, Jacob Luke fitted the earphones over his ears. He fancied he could hear Bud's voice tremble. For a moment it was just Bud's voice speaking the alien language, and then, very distant and clear in his earphones, he heard the recorded voice of the linguist say an English word, then a mechanical click, and another clear word in the voice of one of the other translators. Then another, as the alien's voice flowed from the loudspeaker, the cool single words barely audible, overlapping and blending with it like translating thought, skipping unfamiliar words yet quite astonishingly clear. Radar shows no buildings or civilization near. The atmosphere around us registers as thick as glue. Tremendous gas pressure, low gravity, no light at all. You didn't describe it like this. Where are you, Joe? This isn't some kind of trick, is it? Bud hesitated, was prompted by a deeper official voice, and jerked out the words. If it is a trick, we are ready to repel attack. The linguist stood listening. He whitened slowly and beckoned the other linguists over to him and whispered to them. 
Joseph Nathan looked at them with unwarranted, bitter hostility while he picked up the hand mic, plugging it into the translator. Joe calling, he said quietly into it in clear, slow English. No trick. We don't know where you are. I am trying to get a direction fix from your signal. Describe your surroundings to us, if at all possible. Nearby, the floodlights blazed steadily on the television platform, ready for the official welcome of the aliens to Earth. The television channels of the world had been alerted to set aside their scheduled programs for an unscheduled great event. In the long room, the people waited, listening for the swelling sound of rocket jets. This time, after the light came on, there was a long delay. The speaker sputtered and sputtered again, building to a steady scratching they could barely sense as a dim voice. It came through in a few tinny words, and then wavered back to inaudibility. The machine translated in their earphones. Tried. Seemed. Repair. Suddenly it came in clearly. Can't tell if the auxiliary blew, too. We'll try it. We might pick you up clearly on the next try. I have the volume down. Where is the landing port? Repeat, where is the landing port? Where are you? Nathan put down the hand mic and carefully set a dial on the recording box and flipped a switch, speaking over his shoulder. This sets it to repeat what I said the last time. It keeps repeating. Then he sat with unnatural stillness, his head still half-turned, as if he had suddenly caught a glimpse of answer and was trying with no success whatever to grasp it. The green warning light cut in, the recording clicked, and the playback of Bud's face and voice appeared on the screen. We heard a few words, Joe, and then the receiver blew again. We're adjusting a viewing screen to pick up the long waves that go through the murk and convert them to visible light. We'll be able to see out soon. The engineer says that something is wrong with the stern jets, and the captain has had me broadcast a help call to our nearest space base. He made the mouth O of a grin. The message won't reach it for some years. I trust you, Joe, but get us out of here, will you? They're buzzing that the screen is finally ready. Hold everything. The screen went grey, and the green light went off. The Times considered the lag required for the help call, the speaking and recording of the message just received, the time needed to reconvert a viewing screen. They work fast. He shifted uneasily and added at random. Something wrong with the time factor. All wrong. They work too fast. The green light came on again immediately. Nathan half turned to him, sliding his words hastily into the gap of time as the message was recorded and slowed. They're close enough for our transmission power to blow their receiver. If it was on Earth, why the darkness around the ship? Maybe they see in the high ultraviolet. The atmosphere is opaque to that band, the time suggested hastily as the speaker began to talk in the young extraterrestrial's voice. It was shaking now. Stand by for the description. They tensed, waiting. The times brought a map of the state before his mind's eye. A half circle of cliffs around the horizon. A wide muddy lake swarming with swimming things. Huge, strange white foliage all around the ship and incredibly huge pulpy monsters attacking and eating each other on all sides. We almost landed in the lake, right on the soft edge. The mud can't hold the ship's weight and we're sinking. The engineer says we might be able to blast free, but the tubes are mud-clogged and might blow up the ship. When can you reach us? The Times thought vaguely of the Carboniferous era. Nathan obviously had seen something he had not. Where are they? The Times asked him quietly. Nathan pointed to the antenna position indicators. The Times let his eyes follow the converging imaginary lines of focus out the window to the sunlit airfield, the empty airfield, the drying concrete and green waving grass where the lines met. Where the lines met? The spaceship was there. The fear of something unknown gripped him suddenly. The spaceship was broadcasting again. Where are you? Answer if possible. 
We are sinking. Where are you? He saw that Nathan knew. What is it? The Times asked hoarsely. Are they in another dimension, or the past, or on another world, or what? Nathan was smiling bitterly, and Jacob Luke remembered that the young man had a friend in that spaceship. My guess is that they evolved on a high-gravity planet with a thin atmosphere near a blue-white star. Sure, they see in the ultraviolet range. Our sun is abnormally small and dim and yellow. Our atmosphere is so thick it screens out ultraviolet. He laughed harshly. A good joke on us, the weird place we evolved in, the thing it did to us. Where are you? called the alien spaceship. Hurry, please, we're sinking. The decoder slowed his tumbled, frightened words and looked up into the Times' face for understanding. We'll rescue them, he said quietly. You were right about the time factor, right about them moving at a different speed. I misunderstood. This business about squawk coding, speeding for better transmission to counteract beam waver, I was wrong. What do you mean? They don't speed up their broadcasts. They don't? Suddenly, in his mind's eye, the Times began to see again the play he had just seen. But the actors were moving at blurring speed, the words jerking out in a fluting, dizzying stream, thoughts and decisions passing with unfollowable rapidity rippling faces in a twisting blur of expressions, doors slamming wildly, shatteringly, as the actors leaped in and out of rooms. No, faster, faster! He wasn't visualising it as rapidly as it was. An hour of talk and action in one almost instantaneous squawk, a narrow peak of noise interfering with a single word in an Earth broadcast. Faster, faster! It was impossible! Matter could not stand such stress, inertia, momentum, abrupt weight. It was insane. Why? he asked. How? Nathan laughed again harshly, reaching for the mic. Get them out. There isn't a lake or river within hundreds of miles from here. A shiver of unreality went down the Times's spine. Automatically and inanely, he found himself delving in his pocket for a cigarette while he tried to grasp what had happened. Where are they, then? Why can't we see their spaceship? Nathan switched the microphone on in a gesture that showed the bitterness of his disappointment. We'll need a magnifying glass for that. If you're enjoying the stories, I'd appreciate it if you hit the like button to support the channel. Thanks. Zeritsky's Law by Anne Warren Griffith Narrated by William Skye This story is brought to you by my Patreon backers, particularly Frederick Burrell. Thank you so much for your continued support. Why bother building a time machine when there's something much easier to find right in your own kitchen? Somebody someday will make a study of the influence of animals on history. Although not as famous as Mrs. O'Leary's cow, Mrs. Graham's cat should certainly be included in any such study. It has now been definitely established that the experiences of this cat led to the idea of quick-frozen people, which in turn led to the passage of Zeritsky's Law. We must go back to the files of the Los Angeles newspapers for 1950 to find the story. In brief, a Mrs. Fred C. Graham missed her pet cat on the same day that she put a good deal of food down in her home deep freeze unit. She suspected no connection between the two events. The cat was not to be found until six days later, when its owner went to fetch something from the deep freeze. Much as she loved her pet, we may imagine that she was more horror than grief-stricken at her discovery. She lifted the little ice-encased body out of the deep freeze and set it on the floor. Then she managed to run as far as the next-door neighbour's house before fainting. Mrs. Graham became hysterical after she was revived, and it was several hours before she could be quieted enough to persuade anybody that she hadn't made up the whole thing. She prevailed upon her neighbour to go back to the house with her. In front of the deep freeze they found a small pool of water, and a wet cat busily licking itself. 
The neighbour subsequently told reporters that the cat was concentrating its licking on one of its hind legs, where some ice still remained, so that she, for one, believed the story. A follow-up dispatch, published a week later, reported that the cat was unharmed by the adventure. Further, Mrs. Graham was quoted as saying that the cat had had a large meal just before its disappearance, that as soon after its rescue as it had dried itself off, it took a long nap, precisely as it always did after a meal, and that it was not hungry again until evening. It was clear from the accounts that the life processes had been stopped dead in their tracks, and had, after defrosting, resumed at exactly the point where they left off. Perhaps it is unfair to put all the responsibility on one luckless cat. Had such a thing happened anywhere else in the country, it would have been talked about, believed by a few, disbelieved by most, and forgotten. But as the historic kick of Mrs. O'Leary's cow achieved significance because of the time and place that it was delivered, so the falling of Mrs. Graham's cat into the deep freeze became significant because it occurred in Los Angeles. There, and probably only there, the event was anything but forgotten. The principles it revealed became the basis of a hugely successful business. How shall we regard the Zeritsky brothers? As arch-villains or pioneers? In support of the latter view, it must be admitted that the spirit of inquiry and the willingness to risk the unknown were indisputably theirs. However, their pioneering, if we agree to call it that, was equally indisputably bound up with the quest for a fast buck. Some of their first clients paid as high as $15,000 for the initial freezing, and the exorbitant rate of $1,000 per year as a storage charge. The Zeritsky brothers owned and managed one of the largest quick-freezing plants in the world, and it was their claim that converting the freezing equipment and storage facilities to accommodate humans was extremely expensive, hence the high rates. When the early clients who paid these rates were defrosted years later, and found other clients receiving the same services for as little as $3,000, they threatened a row, and the Zeritskys made substantial refunds. By that time they could easily afford it, and since any publicity about their enterprise was unwelcome to them, all refunds were made without a whimper. $3,000 became the standard rate, with $100 per year the storage charge, and no charge for defrosting. The Zeritskys were businessmen, first and last. Anyone who had the fee could put himself away for whatever period of time he wished, and no questions asked. The ironclad rule that full payment must be made in advance was broken only once, as far as the records show. A certain young man had a very wealthy uncle residing in Milwaukee whose heir he was, but the uncle was not getting along in years fast enough. The young man, then eighteen years old, did not wish to waste the best years of his life as a poor boy. He wanted the money while he was young, but his uncle was as healthy as he was wealthy. The Zeritskys were the obvious answer to his problem. The agreement between them has been preserved. They undertook to service the youth without advance payment. They further undertook to watch the Milwaukee papers until the demise of the uncle should be reported, whereupon they would defrost the boy. In exchange for this, the youth, thinking of course that money would be no object when he came out, agreed to pay double. The uncle lived seventeen years longer, during which time he seems to have forgotten his nephew and to have become deeply interested in a mystic society to which he left his entire fortune. The Zeritskys duly defrosted the boy, and whether they or he were the more disappointed is impossible to imagine. They never forgot the lesson, and never made another exception to their rule. He, poor fellow, spent the rest of his life, including the best years, paying off his debt which at $3,000 plus 17 years at $100 per year, and the whole doubled, amounted to $9,400. The books record his slow but regular payments over the next 43 years, and indicate that he had only $250 left to pay when he died. We may, I think, assume that various underworld characters who were grateful ex-clients of the Zeritskys were instrumental in persuading the boy to keep up his payments. Criminals were the first to apply for quick freezing, and formed the mainstay of the Zeritskys' business through the years. What more easy than to rob, hide the loot, except for that all-important advance payment, 
present yourself to the Zeritskys and remain in their admirable chambers for five or ten years, emerge to find the hue and cry long since died down and the crime forgotten, recover your hall, and live out your life in luxury. Due to the shady character of most of their patrons, the Zeritskys kept all records by a system of numbers. Names never appeared on the books, and anonymity was guaranteed. Law enforcement agents looking for fugitives from justice found no way to break down this system, nor any law which they could interpret as making it illegal to quick freeze. Perhaps the truth is that they did not search too diligently for a law that could be made to apply. As long as the Zeritskys kept things quiet and did not advertise or attract public attention, they could safely continue their bizarre business. City officials of Los Angeles, and particularly members of the police force, enjoyed a period of unparalleled prosperity. Lawyers and other experts who thought they were on the track of legal means by which to liquidate the Zeritsky Empire found themselves suddenly able to buy a ranch or a yacht or both, and retire forever from the arduous task of earning a living. Even with a goodly part of the population of Los Angeles as permanent pensioners, the Zeritsky fortune grew to incredible proportions. By the time the Zeritsky brothers died and left the business to their sons, it was a gold mine, and an inexhaustible one at that. During these later years, the enterprise began to attract a somewhat better class of people. Murderers and other criminals continued to furnish the bulk of the business, but as word of this amazing service seeped through the country, others began to see in it an easy way of solving their problems. They were encouraged, too, by the fact that the process was painless and the firm completely reliable. There were no risks, no accidents, no fatalities. One could, in short, have confidence in the Zeritskys. Soon after Monaghan's great exposure rocked the nation, however, many of these better-type clients leaped into print to tell their experiences. One of the most poignant stories came from the daughter of a Zeritsky client. Her father was still, at the age of 102, passionately interested in politics, but the chances of his lasting until the next election were not good. The daughter herself suggested the deep freeze, and he welcomed the idea. He decided on a 20-year stay because, in his own words, if the Republicans can't get into the White House in 20 years, I give up. Upon his return, he found that his condition had not been fulfilled. His daughter described him as utterly baffled by the new world. He lived in it just a week before he left it, this time for good. She states his last words were, How do you people stand it? Some professional people patronised the Zeritskys, chiefly movie stars. After the expose, fan magazines were filled with accounts of how the stars had kept youthful. The more zealous ones had prolonged their screen lives for years by the simple expedient of storing themselves away between pictures. We may imagine the feelings of their public upon discovering that the seemingly eternal youth of their favourites was due to the Zeritskys and not, as they had been led to believe, to expensive creams, lotions, diet and exercise. There was a distinctly unfavourable reaction, and the letter columns of the fan magazines bristled with angry charges of cheating. But next to criminals, the majority of people who applied for quick freezing seems to have been husbands or wives caught in insupportable marital situations. Their experiences were subsequently written up in the confession magazines. It was usually the husband who fled to Los Angeles and incarcerated himself for an appropriate number of years, at the end of which time his unamiable spouse would have died or made other arrangements. If we can believe the magazines, this scheme worked out very well in most cases. There was, inevitably, one spiteful wife who divined her husband's intentions. By shrewd reasoning, she figured approximately the number of years he had chosen to be absent and put herself away for a like period. In a TV dramatization rather pessimistically entitled You Can't Get Away, the husband described his sensations upon being defrosted after fifteen years only to find his wife waiting for him right there in the reception room of the Zeritsky plant. She was as perfectly preserved as I was, he said. Every irritating habit that had made my life unbearable with her was absolutely intact. 
The sins of the fathers may be visited on the sons, but how often we see repeated the old familiar pattern of the sons destroying the life work of the fathers. The Zaritsky brothers were fanatically meticulous. They supervised every detail of their operations and kept their records with an elaborate system of checks and double checks. They were shrewd enough to realize that complete dependability was essential to their business. A satisfied Zaritsky client was a silent client. One dissatisfied client would be enough to blow the business apart. The sons, in their greed, over-expanded to the point where they could not, even among the four of them, personally supervise each and every detail. A fatal mistake was bound to occur sooner or later. When it did, the victim broadcast his grievance to the world. The story appeared in a national magazine, every copy of which was sold an hour after it appeared on the stands. Under the title, They Put the Freeze on Me, John A. Monaghan told his tragic tale. At the age of thirty-seven, he had fallen desperately in love with a girl of sixteen. She was immature and frivolous and wanted to play around a little more before she settled down. She told me, he wrote, to come back in five years, and that started me thinking. In five years I'd be forty-two, and what would a girl of twenty-one want with a man twice as old as her? John Monaghan moved in circles where the work of the Zaritskys was well known. Not only did he see an opportunity of being still only thirty-seven when his darling reached twenty-one, but he foresaw a painless way of passing the years which he must endure without her. Accordingly, he presented himself for the deep freeze, paid his three thousand dollars and the five hundred dollars storage charge in advance, and left, he claimed, written instructions to let me out in five years so there'd be no mistakes. Nobody knows how the slip happened, but somehow John A. Monaghan, or rather the number assigned to him, was entered on the books for twenty-five years instead of five years. Upon being defrosted, and discovering that a quarter of a century had elapsed, his rage was awesome. Along with everything else, his love for his sweetheart had been perfectly preserved, but she had given up waiting for him and was a happy mother of two boys and six girls. Monaghan's accusation that the Zaritskys had ruined his life may be taken with a grain of salt. He was still a young man, and the rumour that he received a hundred thousand for the magazine rights to his story was true. As most readers are aware, what has come to be known as Zaritsky's Law was passed by Congress and signed by the President three days after Monaghan's story broke. Seventy-five years after Mrs. Graham's cat fell into the freezer, it became the law of the land that the mandatory penalty for anyone applying quick-freezing methods to any living thing, human or animal, was death. Also, all quick-frozen people were to be defrosted immediately. Los Angeles papers reported that beginning on the day Monaghan's story appeared, men by the thousands poured into the city. They continued to come, choking every available means of transport, for the next two days, until, that is, Zaritsky's law went through. When we consider the date and remember that due to the gravity of the international situation, a bill had just been passed drafting all men from 16 to 60, we realise why Congress had to act. The Zaritskys, of course, were among the first to be taken. Because of their experience, they were put in charge of a military warehouse for dehydrated foods, and warned not to get any ideas for a new business. An Empty Bottle by Mary Wolfe Narrated by William Skye They wanted to go home, back to the planet they'd known. But even the stars had changed. Did the fate of all creation hinge upon an empty bottle? Hugh McCann took the last of the photographic plates out of the developer and laid them on the table beside the others. Then he picked up the old star charts, volume one, number one, maps of space from various planetary systems within a hundred light years of Sol. He looked around the observation room at the others. We might as well start checking. The men and women around the table nodded. 
none of them said anything. Even the muffled conversation from the corridor beyond the observation room ceased as the people stopped to listen. McCann set the charts down and opened them at the first sheet, the composite map of the stars as seen from Earth. Don't be too disappointed if we're wrong, he said. Amos Carhill's fists clenched. He leaned across the table. You still don't believe we're near Sol, do you? You're getting senile, Hugh. You know the mathematics of our position as well as anybody. I know the math, Hugh said quietly. But remember, a lot of our basics have already proved themselves false this trip. We can't be sure of anything. Besides, I think I'd remember this planet we're on if we'd ever been here before. We visited every planetary system within a hundred light-years of Sol the first year. Carhill laughed. What's there to remember about this hunk of rock? Tiny, airless, mountainless, the most monotonous piece of matter we've landed on in years. Hugh shrugged and turned to the next chart. The others clustered around him, checking, comparing the chart with the photographic plates of their position, finding nothing familiar in the star pattern. I still think we would have remembered this planet, Hugh said, just because it is so monotonous. After all, what have we been looking for all these years? Life. Other worlds with living forms, other types of evolution, types adapted to different environments. This particular planet is less capable of supporting life than our own moon. Martha Carhill looked up from the charts. Her face was as tense and strained as her husband's, and the lines about her mouth deeply etched. We've got to be near Earth. We've just got to. We've got to find people again. Her voice broke. We've been looking for so long. Hugh McCann sighed. The worry that had been growing in him ever since they first left the rim of the galaxy and turned homeward deepened into a nagging fear. He didn't know why he was afraid. He too hoped that they were near Earth. He almost believed that they would soon be home. But the others? Their reactions? He shook his head. They no longer merely hoped. With them, especially with the older ones, it was faith, a blind, unreasoning, fanatic faith that their journey was almost over and they would be on Earth again and pick up the lives they had left behind fifty-three years before. Look, Amos Carhill said, here are our reference points. Here's Andromeda Galaxy and the Dark Nebula and the Arch of our own Milky Way. He pointed to the places he had named on the plates. Now we can check some of these high-magnitude reference stars with the charts. Hugh let him take the charts and go through them, checking, rejecting. Carhill was probably right. He'd find Sol soon enough. It had been too long for one ship full of people to follow a quest, especially a hopeless one. For fifty-three years they had scouted the galaxy looking for other worlds with life forms. A check on diverging evolutions, they had called it. Uncounted thousands of suns without planets bypassed. Thousands of planetary systems explored or merely looked at and rejected. Heavy, cold worlds with methane atmospheres and lifeless rocks without atmospheres and even Earth-sized, Earth-type planets with oceans and oxygen and warmth. But no life. No life anywhere. That was one of the basics they had lost years ago, their belief that life would arise on any planet capable of supporting it. We could take a spectrographic analysis of some of those high-magnitude stars, Carhill said. Then abruptly he straightened, eyes alight, his hand on the last chart. We don't need it after all. Look, there's Sirius, and here it is on the plates. That means Alpha Centauri must be... He paused. He frowned and ran his hand over the plate to where the first magnitude star was photographed. It must be. Alpha Centauri. It has to be. Except that it's over five degrees out of position. Hugh looked at the plate and then at the chart, and then back at the plate again. And then he knew what it was that he had feared subconsciously all along. You're right, Amos, he said slowly. There's Alpha Centauri, about twenty light-years away. 
and there's Sirius, and Arcturus, and Betelgeuse, and all the others. He pointed them out one by one in their unfamiliar locations on the plates. But they're all out of position in reference to each other. He stopped. The others stared back at him, not saying anything. Little by little, the faith began to drain out of their eyes. What does it mean? Martha Carhill's voice was only a whisper. It means that we discarded one basic too many, Hugh McCann said. Relativity. The theory that our subjective time here on the ship would differ from objective time outside. No, Amos Carhill said slowly. No, it's a mistake. That's all. We haven't gone into the future. We can't have. It isn't possible that more time has elapsed outside the ship than— Why not? Hugh said softly. Why not millions of years? We've exceeded the speed of light many times. Which disproves that space-time theory in itself! Carhill shouted. Does it? Hugh said. Or does it just mean we never really understood space-time at all? He didn't wait for them to answer. He pointed at the small, far-from-brilliant star that lay beyond Alpha Centauri on the plates. That's probably Sol. If it is, we can find out the truth soon enough. He looked at their faces and wondered what their reactions would be, if the truth was what he feared. The ship throbbed softly, pulsating in the typical vibrations of low-speed drive. In the forward view screens the star grew larger. The people didn't look at it very often. They moved about the corridors of the ship much as they usually moved, but quietly. They seemed to be trying to ignore the star. You can't be sure, Hugh. Nora McCann laid her hand on her husband's arm. No, of course I can't be sure. The door from their quarters into the corridor was open. Several more people came in, young people who had been born on the ship. They were talking and laughing. Would it be so hard on the young ones, Hugh? They've never seen the Earth. They're used to finding nothing but lifeless worlds everywhere. One of the young boys in the hall looked up at the corridor view screen and pointed at the star, and then shrugged. The others turned away, not saying anything, and after a minute they left, and the boy followed them. There's your answer, Hugh McCann said dully. Earth's a symbol to them. It's home. It's the place where there are millions more like us. Sometimes I think it's the only thing that has kept us sane all these years, the knowledge that there is a world full of people somewhere, that we're not alone. Her hand found his and he gripped it almost absently, and then he looked up at their own small view screen. The star was much bigger now. It was already a definite circle of yellow light. A yellow G-type sun, like a thousand others they had approached and orbited around and left behind them. A yellow sun that could have been anywhere in the galaxy. Hugh, she said after a moment, do you really believe that thousands of years have gone by outside? I don't know what to believe. I only know what the plates show. That may not even be Sol up ahead, she said doubtfully. We may be in some other part of space altogether, and that's why the charts are different. Perhaps. But either way, we're lost. Lost in space, or in time, or in both. What does it matter? If we're just lost in space, it's not so, so irrevocable. We could still find our way back to Earth, maybe. He didn't answer. He looked up at the screen and the circle of light, and his lips tightened. Whatever the truth was, they didn't have long to wait. They'd be within gravitational range in less than an hour. He wondered why he was reacting so differently from the others. He was just as afraid as they were, he knew that. But he wasn't fighting the thought that perhaps they had really travelled out of their own time. He wondered what it was that made him different from the other old ones, the ones like Carhill who refused even to face the possibility, who insisted on clinging to their illusions in the face of the photographic evidence. He didn't think that he was a pessimist, and yet after only three years of their trip, after only fifty Earth-like but lifeless worlds, 
He had been the first to consider the possibility that life was unique to Earth and that their old theories concerning its spontaneous emergence from a favourable environment might be wrong. Only Nora had agreed with him then. Only Nora could face this possibility with him now. The two of them were very much alike in their outlooks. They were both pragmatists. But this time there would be no long years during which the others could slowly shift their opinions, slowly relinquish their old beliefs and turn to new ones. The yellow sun was too large and urgent in the screen. Phew! He turned to the door and saw Amos Carhill standing there, bracing himself against the corridor wall. There was no colour at all in Carhill's face. Come on up to the control room with me, Hugh. We're going to start decelerating any minute now. Hugh frowned. He would prefer to stay and watch their approach on the screen with Nora at his side. He had no duties in the control room. He was too old to have any part in the actual handling of the ship. Amos was old too. But they would be there, all the old ones, looking through the high-powered screens for the first clear glimpse of the third planet from the sun. All right, Amos. Hugh got up and started for the door. I'll wait here for you, Hugh, Nora said. He smiled at her and then followed Carhill out into the crowded corridor. No one spoke to them. Most of the people they passed were neither talking nor paying any attention to anything except the corridor screens, which they could no longer ignore. The few who were talking spoke about Earth and how wonderful it would be to get home again. You're wrong, Hugh, Amos said suddenly. I hope I am. The crowd thinned out as they passed into the forward bulkheads. The only men they saw now were the few young ones on duty. Except for their set, anxious faces, they might have been handling any routine landing in any routine system. The ship quivered for just a second as it shifted over into deceleration. There was an instant of vertigo, and then it was gone, and the ship's gravity felt as normal as ever. Hugh didn't even break stride at the shift. He followed Carhill to the control room doorway and pushed his way in, taking a place among the others who already clustered about the great forward screen. The pilot ignored them and worked his controls. The screen cleared as the ship's deceleration increased. The pilot didn't look at it. He was a young man. He had never seen the Earth. Look! Amos Carhill cried triumphantly. The screen focused. The selector swung away from the yellow sun and swept its orbits. The dots that were planets came into focus and out again. Hugh McCann didn't even need to count them, nor to calculate their distance from the sun. He knew the system too well to have any trouble recognising it. The sun was Sol. The third planet was the double dot of Earth and Moon. He realised suddenly that he had more than half expected to see an empty orbit. It's the Earth, all right, Carhill said. We're home. They were all staring at the double dot where the selector focused sharply now. Hugh McCann alone looked past it, at the background of stars that were strewn in totally unfamiliar patterns across the sky. He sighed. Look beyond the system, he said. They looked. For a long time they stared, none of them speaking and then they turned to Hugh, many of them accusingly, as if he himself had rearranged the stars. "'How long have we been gone?' Carhill's voice broke. Hugh shook his head. The star patterns were too unfamiliar for even a guess. There was no way of knowing yet how long their fifty-three years had really been. Carhill shook his head slowly. He turned back to the screen and stared at the still, featureless dot that was the Earth. "'We can't be the only ones left,' he said. No one answered him. They were still stunned. They couldn't even accept yet the strange constellations on the screen. End of the voyage. Fifty-three years of searching for worlds with life. And now Earth under an unfamiliar sky 
and quite possibly no life at all anywhere except on the ship. We might as well land, McCann said. The ship curved away from the night side of the earth and crossed again into the day. They were near enough so that the planetary features stood out sharply now, even through the dense clouds that rose off the oceans. But although the continental land masses and the islands were clearly defined, they were as unrecognisable as the star constellations had been. That must be North America, Amos Carhill said dully. It's smaller than the continent on the night side. It might be anywhere, Hugh McCann said. We can't tell. The oceans look bigger too. There's less land surface. He stared down at the topography thousands of miles below them. Mountains rose jaggedly. There were great plains and crevasses and a rocky, lifeless look everywhere. No soil, no erosion except from the wind and the rains. There's no chlorophyll in the spectrum, Haynes said. It seems to rule out even plant life. I don't understand, Martha Carhill turned away from the screen. Everything's so different. But the moon looked just exactly like it always did. That's because it has no atmosphere, Hugh said, so there's no erosion, and no oceans to sweep in over the land. But I imagine that if we explored it we'd find changes. New craters. Maybe even new mountains by now. How long has it been? Carhill whispered. And even if it's been millions of years, what happened? Why aren't there any plants? Won't we find anything? Maybe there was an atomic war, the pilot said. Maybe. Carhill had thought of that too. Probably all of them had. Or maybe the sun novaed. No one answered him. The concept of a nova and then of its dying down until now the sun was just as it had been when they left was too much. The sun looks hotter, Carhill added. The ship dropped lower, its preliminary circle of the planet completed. It settled in for a landing, just as it had done thousands of times before. And the world below could have been any of a thousand others. They dropped quickly, breaking through the atmosphere, riding it down. The topography came up to meet them, and the general features blurred, leaving details standing out sharply, increasing in sharpness as if the valleys and mountains below were tiny microscopic crystals under a rapidly increasing magnification. The pilot picked their landing place without difficulty. It was a typical choice, a spot on the broad, shelving plain at the edge of the ocean, the type of base from which all tests on a planet could be run quickly and a report written up, and the files of another world closed and tagged with a number and entered in one of the great storage encyclopedias. Even to Hugh there was an air of unreality about the landing, as if this planet wasn't really Earth at all, despite its orbit around the sun, despite its familiar moon. It looked too much like too many others. The actual landing was over quickly. The ship quivered, jarred slightly, and then was still, resting on the graveled plain that had obviously once been part of the ocean bed. The ocean itself lay only a few hundred yards away. Hugh McCann looked out through the viewscreen, turned to direct vision now. He stared at the waves swelling against the shore, and his sense of unreality deepened. Even though this was what he had more than half expected, he couldn't quite accept it yet. We might as well go out and look around, he said. Air pressure, earth norm, Haynes began checking off the control panel by rote. Composition, oxygen, nitrogen, water vapour. There's certainly nothing out there that could hurt us, Martha Carhill snapped. What could there be? We might check for radioactivity, Hugh said quietly. She turned and stared at him. Her mouth opened and then snapped shut again. No, Haynes said, there's no radioactivity either. Everything's clear. We won't need spacesuits. He pressed the button that opened the inner locks. Carhill glanced over at him and then switched on the communicator, and the noises from the rest of the ship flooded into the control room. 
everywhere people were milling about. Snatches of talk drifted in, caught up in the background as various duty officers reported clearance on the landing. Most of the background voices were young, talking too loudly and with too much forced cheerfulness about what lay outside the ship. Hugh sighed, as aware of all the people as if he were out in the corridors with them. It was the space-born ones who were doing most of the talking. The children, the young people, the people no longer young but still born since the voyage started, still looking upon Earth more as a wonderful legend than as their own place of origin. The old ones, those who had left the Earth in their own youth, had the least of all to say. They knew what was missing outside. The younger ones couldn't really know. Even the best of the books and the pictures and the three-dimensional movies can give only a superficial idea of what a living world is like. Hugh! Cahill clutched his arm. Yes, Amos? There must be people somewhere. There have to be. Our race can't be dead. Hugh McCann looked past him, out at the sky and the clouds of water vapour that swelled up to obscure the sun. The stars, of course, were completely hidden in the daylight. If there are any others, Amos, we can be pretty certain they're not on Earth. They may have left. They may have gone somewhere else. No! Martha Carhill's face twisted and then went rigid. There's no one anywhere. There can't be. It's been too long. You saw the stars, Amos. The stars all wrong. Every one of them. Her hands came up to her face and she started to cry. Amos crossed over to her and put his arms around her. Hugh McCann watched them for a moment, and then he turned and left them and went out through the locks after the young people. He didn't know what to think. He wished that they had never turned back to Earth at all, that they had kept going, circling around the rim of the galaxy forever. He went through the outer lock and then down the ramp to the ground. He stood on the earth again for the first time since his early youth. And it was not the same. There was bare rock under his feet, and bare rock all around him, gravel and boulders and even fine-grained sand. But no dust, no dirt, no trace of anything organic or even ever touched by anything organic. He had walked too many worlds like this, too many bare grey worlds with bare grey oceans and clouds of vapour swirling up into the warm air, too many worlds where there was wind and sound and surf, where there should have been life, but wasn't. This was just another of those worlds. This wasn't Earth. This was just a lifeless memory of the Earth he had known and loved. For fifty-three years they had clung to the thought of home, of people waiting for them, welcoming them back some day. Fifty-three years, and for how many of those ship years had Earth lain lifeless like this? He looked up at the sky, and at all the stars that he couldn't see, and he cursed them all, and cursed time itself, and then bitterly, his own fatuous stupidity. The people came out of the ship and walked about on the graveled plain, alone or in small groups. They had stopped talking. They seemed too numbed by what they had found to even think for a while. Shock, Hugh McCann thought grimly. First hysteria and tears and loud unbelief, and now shock. Anything could come next. He stood with the warm wind blowing in his face and watched the people. In the bitter mood that gripped him, he was amused by their reactions. Some of them walked around aimlessly, but most, those who were active in the various departments, soon started about the routine business of running tests on planetary conditions. They seemed to work without thinking, by force of habit, their faces dazed and uncaring. Conditioning, Hugh thought. Starting their reports. The reports that they know perfectly well no one will ever read. He wandered over to where several of the young men were sending up an atmosphere balloon and jotting down the atmospheric constituents as recorded by the instruments. "'How's it going?' he said. "'Earth norm, naturally,' the young man flushed. "'Temperature's up, though. Ninety-three. 
and a 77% humidity. He left them and walked down the rocks to the ocean's edge. Two young girls were down there before him, sampling the water, running both chemical and biological probing tests. Hello, Mr. McCann, the taller girl said dully. Want our report? Found anything? He knew already that there was nothing to find. If there were life, the instruments would have recorded its presence. No. Water temperature 86. Sodium chloride four-fifths Earth normal. She looked up, surprised. Why so low? More water in the ocean, maybe? Or maybe we've had a nova since we were here last. It was getting late, almost sunset. Soon it would be time for the photographic star charts to be made. Hugh brought himself up short and smiled bitterly. He too was in the grip of habit. Still, why not? Perhaps they could estimate somehow how many millions of years had passed. Why? What good would it do them to find out? After a while the sun set and a little later the full moon rose, hazy and indistinct behind the clouds of water vapour. Hugh stared at it, watched it rise higher until it cleared the horizon, a great bloated bulk. Then he sighed and shook his head to clear it and started to work. The clouds were thick. He had to move the screening adjustment almost to its last notch before the vapour patterns blocked out and the stars were bright and unwavering and ready to be photographed. He inserted the first plate and snapped the picture of the stars whose names he knew but whose patterns were wrong, some subtly, some blatantly. There was something he was overlooking, some other factor not taken into account. He developed the first plates and compared them with the star charts of Earth as it had been before they left it, and he shook his head. Whatever the factor was, it eluded him. He went back to work. Oh, here you are, Hugh! He jumped at the sound of Carhill's voice. He had been working almost completely by habit, slowly swinging the telescope across the sky and snapping the plates, and trying to think. Why waste time on that? Carhill added bitterly. Who's ever going to see our records now? Behind Carhill, several of the other old ones nodded. Hugh was surprised that they had managed to come back to the ship without his hearing them. But of course they had come back in at sundown, as usual on a routine check, and now they were gathering to compile their reports. Hugh looked from face to face, wondering if he too was as numb and dazed and haggard appearing as they were. He probably was. What do you suggest, Amos? he said. I say there's no use going on, Carhill said flatly. You've all run your tests, and what have you found? No fossils, not even a single-celled life form in the ocean. No way even to tell how many millions of years it's been. Maybe it hasn't been so long. Haynes said. Maybe something happened here fairly recently, and the people all went to some other system, to one of the Centauri planets, maybe. Amos Carhill laughed bitterly. You can say that in the face of the evidence. We know that millions of years have passed. Nothing's the same. Even the tides are three times what they were. It's obvious what happened. The sun novered, novered and cooled. Do you really believe that our race has lasted that long on some nearby system? His voice rose. He glared about at the others. He threw back his head suddenly and laughed, and the laughter echoed and re-echoed off the steel walls. I say let's die now, Carhill cried. There's no use going on. Hugh was right as usual. We shouldn't have tried to come back. We've been fools all these years, thinking we had a world to come home to. The people muttered, crowded closer. They pushed into the observation room, shoved nearer to it in the outside corridor. They muttered in a rising note of panic as the numbing shock that gripped them gave way. Why not die here? Martha Carhill's voice rose shrill above the sound of her husband's laughter. We should have died here millions of years ago. Hugh McCann looked at her, and at Amos, and at all the others. He sighed. 
Why not? Why go on? There was no answer. Even a pragmatist gave up eventually when the facts were all against him. He glanced down at the reports on the table. All the routine reports gathered together into routine form, written up in routine terminology. Reports on an Earth-type planet that just happened to be the Earth itself. And then, quite suddenly, the obvious, satisfactory answer came to him. The factors clicked into place and he wondered why he hadn't thought of them long ago. He looked up from the reports at the people on the verge of panic, and he knew what to say to quiet them. He had the factors now. No, he cried. You're wrong. There's no reason at all to assume that our race is dead. Amos Carhill stopped laughing and stared at him, and the others stared also, and none of them believed him at all. It's simple, he cried. Why has so much time passed outside the ship while to us only fifty-three years have gone by? Because we travel too fast, Cahill said flatly. That's why. Yes, Hugh said softly. But there's one thing we've been forgetting. What we did, others could do also. Probably lots of expeditions started out after we left, all trying for the speed of light. They stared at him. Slowly the dazed look died out of their eyes as they realised what he meant, and what the concept might mean to them. The concept of other ships following them out into time. The concept of other men, also millions of years from the earth they had left. You mean, Carhill said slowly, that you believe other people got caught in the same trap we did? That there may be others in this time also? Hugh nodded. Why not? Maybe they colonised some of those Earth-type planets we checked on. Anyway, we can look for them. No, Carhill shook his head. If any of them had started after us, we would have crossed their paths already. We never have. We never found a trace of any other expedition. Even if there is another, even if there are colonies somewhere, we could spend another fifty years looking. Well, Martha Carhill whispered, why not? It would give us something to look for. Hugh McCann glanced around the circle of faces and saw the new hope that came into them, the new belief that sprang into existence so quickly because they wanted to believe. He smiled somewhat sadly and picked up the pile of reports and the photographs he had just developed. Then he slipped out of the room, through the crowd outside, away from them and the rising hum of their voices. He didn't need to say anything more. The ship would go on. Hugh, is that you? Yes, Nora. She was waiting for him in the corridor. She came up to him and smiled and slipped her arm through his. They walked on together, down the hall past the last of the people. I heard what you said, Hugh. You convinced them. He nodded. I wonder why it took me so long to think of it. The voices died away behind them. They were all alone. They rounded a corner where a viewscreen picked up the image of the moon, so familiar, now the only thing that was familiar about this earth. Nora shivered. You are very logical, Hugh, but I didn't believe you. He glanced around and saw that there was no one near them, and that the communicators in this part of the ship were turned off. Only then did he answer her. I didn't believe myself, Nora. Tell me. When we're outside. They went down the winding ramp that led to the interior of the ship. It too was deserted now. They left the carpeted muffled corridors, and their footsteps rang on the steel plates that lay down the middle of the ship its heart, where the energy converters were, and the disposal units and the plant rooms, and the great glass spheres of the hydroponics tanks. It's ironic, isn't it? Nora said slowly. We left here so long ago, looking for worlds with life, and we come back to find our own world dead. It's ironic, all right. He walked along the row of tanks until he came to the one he was searching for, and then he picked up a glass cylinder and filled it from the tank. I had to tell them something, Nora. They couldn't have gone on otherwise. 
The bottle was full. He stopped it and then turned away. They crossed to the nearest lock and he pushed the button that opened it. They waited a few minutes until the door came open and then they went out down the ramp to the ground across the slippery rocks. Even through the clouds there was enough light to see by. It's warm, she said. It always is now. They were approaching the ocean. The surf beat loudly in their ears. The spray was warm against their faces, almost as warm as the night wind. Tell me, she said. You know what really happened, don't you? I think so. I can't really be sure. They paused on the low ledge where he had stood earlier and watched the girls gather their data for the reports. At their feet, the waves washed up to the edges of the tide pools, eddying into and out of them softly. The water looked dark and cold, but they knew that it too was warm. There have been lots of changes, and they all fit a pattern, he said. The temperature, the difference in salt content in the water, the higher tides. Those things could happen for several reasons, but there's only one explanation for the other changes, the ones I found on the star charts. She waited. The water lapped in and out, reaching almost to where they stood. The earth rotates faster now, he said, and the stars are nearer, much nearer than they were. Isn't that impossible? How do we know? We exceeded the speed of light. Who could say what continuum that might have put us in? I remember an analogy I read once in a layman's book on different theories of space-time. The future and the past, two branches of a hyperbola, each with the speed of light as its limit. You mean, she whispered, that we're not in the future at all? We're in the past, the far past, before there was any life on Earth? He looked down at the pools of water at their feet, the lifeless water that according to all their old discarded theories should have been teeming with life. He nodded slowly and lifted the glass cylinder he had brought from the ship and stared at it. That bottle, she whispered. You filled it with bacteria, didn't you? He nodded again. You're mad, Hugh. You can't mean that that bottle is the origin of life on Earth. You can't. Maybe this isn't our Earth, Nora. Maybe there are thousands of continuums and thousands of Earths all waiting for a ship to land some day and give them life. Slowly, he unstoppered the cylinder and knelt down at the water's edge. For a minute he paused, wondering if there were other continuums or only this one, wondering just how deep the paradox lay. Then he tipped the bottle up and poured, and the liquid from the cylinder ran down into the tide pools and eddied there and was lost in the liquid of the ocean. He poured until the bottle was empty and all the single-celled bacteria from the ship's tank mingled with the warm, lifeless waters. The water temperatures were the same. Everything was the same, and the conditions were very favourable, and the bacteria would divide and redivide and keep on dividing for millions of years. We'll hold the ship under light speed, he said, and in a few million years we can drop back here and see how evolution is getting along. He stood up, and she took his hand and moved closer to him. They were both shivering despite the warmth of the air. But how did life originate in the beginning? she asked suddenly. Hugh McCann shook his head in the darkness. I don't know. We've been all over the galaxy and haven't found life anywhere. Perhaps it can't have a natural cause. Perhaps it's always planted, a closed circle from beginning to end. But something, someone must have started the circle. Who? He looked down at the empty cylinder that he had dropped at the water's edge, and then he looked out at the ocean, lifeless no longer. And once again he shook his head. We did, Nora. We're the beginning. For a long moment their eyes met and held, 
and then they turned and walked away from the ocean back toward the ship and the people, and the moonlight glinted off the empty bottle. Remember to hit the like button. It helps these stories spread to more people. Thanks. Rebuttal by Betsy Curtis Narrated by William Skye Immortality? Like anything else, it may be a matter of definition, or just of the point of view. They brought Father Philip Burt to St. Luke's as our share of the research project on the mysterious disease which afflicted most of the crew of the recently returned Phoenix Nebula expedition. News of the disease, of course, was not spread beyond the research teams, as the public seems to fear a plague worse than damnation itself. And it didn't seem to be a very serious disease. Father Philip was easily the worst case of all, and although several members of the expedition had died, their deaths could be evaluated as due to secondary infections of common enough Earth origin. Very few of the crew members were in actual pain, but Father Philip was in constant agony which no amount of sedation seemed to calm. I ran the customary tissue cultures and biopsies, including those on internal organs not customarily available. We were given an excuse for getting internal samples of tissue when Father Philip's appendix flamed into infection. And although I did not find a general infecting organism, what I did find was enough to send me trotting up to his room on the double. I suppose I should explain here that I, Father Nicolo Molina, am head research pathologist for St. Luke's, and that I don't, therefore, meet the patients personally very often. But Father Philip I had to meet. His day nurse, Sister Mary Felicia, met me at the door in her crisp white Teflon overall. Father is very uncomfortable today, she told me. The incision is not healing at all, and he keeps trying to talk and then breaking off in the middle of a sentence with the pain. Talking about anything in particular? I asked suspiciously. The merest chit-chat. The weather, pleasantries about the hospital, jokes about doctors in particular. He doesn't have a very high regard for doctors, it seems. Thinks they are notable atheists, I gather. She smiled. Many thanks for the diagnosis, sister, I told her gravely. Then I added, I suppose you are having to maintain a considerable quarantine and decontamination routine as father's nurse. Oh yes, in this wing, you know, we are all in solitary, approaching no persons other than our patient and the doctors, sometimes for as much as three months after the end of a case. It provides excellent time for a retreat, which is why most of us apply for such duty. She pointed to the small pre dieu in her tiny cubicle, which stood as a buffer between the contagion room and the hallway of the ward. If I am right about the nature of Father Bert's disease, I told her, you will soon see the end of this case, and without any three months' decontamination either. She smiled again. You couldn't say a happier thing, she said, even though I shall probably apply for a leprosy case if I am relieved of this one. I've become very concerned about Father Philip. Good. He needs your prayers as no man probably ever needed them before. I'll see him now. I crossed her small room and opened the inner door and went in. Father Philip was lying flat in the narrow white bed, his arms lying listlessly on either side of the slight hump of his body under the sheet. The big bulge halfway down was his knees over a pillow, the usual position for post-operative appendectomies. He squeezed out a smile with an effort. "'Morning, Doctor,' he said. "'Father Nick,' I smiled back. "'Father Nick Molina of Pathology, Father.' His wasted body jerked as if with a knife thrust. Then he said, "'Excuse me, I had forgotten that there were doctors who were not laymen. I'm sorry.' He drew up a shoulder against his cheek in a curious gesture, then shivered. "'Sorry for what?' I asked. Just sorry, I guess. He winced and was silent. Sorry for me? Well, yes. That I'm not a layman? You could put it that way. That's a very interesting statement, Father, and one about which I want to know a good deal more after I've asked you some other questions. You see, I think I know what's the matter with you, 
and it's definitely curable. It is not curable. His voice had a flat finality, and his lips drew into a thin, firm line. Let me ask you the questions anyway, father, I said. He gave no other sign. Have you ever looked through a microscope? At the little beasties? Yes, in college. Well, that's what I have just finishing doing with a number of slivers of living tissue from your body. Do you know what I saw that would bring me up here? I might, he answered warily. What do you think? Cancer, maybe. No, cancer cells have their own pattern of behaviour, which is very pretty and, of course, no longer at all deadly. You do not have cancer, but the cells of your kidneys, for instance, are doing something I've never seen live kidney cells doing. And what is that? he said, as if he really couldn't care less. Nothing in particular. This is unheard of indeed. Kidney cells are busy little widgets, doing a tremendous job night and day. Like the individual muscle fibres of the heart, they work on year after year with no vacations, no coffee breaks, secure in the knowledge of their purpose. No pseudo-sermons, please, Father. Father Philip's voice was stern. You don't have to Peter Rabbit up biology for me. A scholar indeed to have heard of Peter Rabbit. I laughed, but he did not smile. Then I asked, Do you want to see how real kidney cells, yours, are behaving? I have a projecting microscope in the basement. Do you want to see what's going on? Not particularly. If you think you can cure me, go ahead and try. Are you willing to pray for your own recovery? No. He spat out the word with a ferocity that seemed to surprise even himself. Then I am going to sermonize indeed. And you are going to listen, my dear little kidney cell. Oh, go ahead. But I warn you that I know something that will cancel it all in advance. He had developed more force of personality than he had showed since I came in. Oh, then suppose you tell me about that. I always do better in rebuttal. And he blurted it out. The whole story of the Phoenix Nebula expedition, and its discovery of the memorials of that beautiful race which was destroyed utterly in the explosion of its star, the supernova which was our own star of Bethlehem. So you see, he concluded, we found out that ultimate dreadful secret of the cosmos, that there is no plan, no purpose, no good God who watches the fall of the sparrows with tender concern. To whom could I pray for my recovery? To the random spin of electrons or planets? To a petty tribal totem? To nothing! We found out. You and the crew. I gave them what answers I could. They asked you, and for a fish you gave them a stone, is that it? Scold away, he said tonelessly. I would not lie to them. The poet Dante, I began. Spare me the poets, he said bitterly. The poet Dante, I repeated firmly, in his recounting of the vision of paradise, came at last to the outside. He had pressed on just as you of the expedition had pressed on, ever outwards, looking for the purpose. He was fortunate, of course, in not actually making his expedition physically, in spite of pretending that he did so. Because space seems to be too big for man to make anything of while he's in the flesh. Anyhow, when Dante got outside, the whole universe did a strange flip-flop. If you can imagine a tennis ball really turning inside out and every other atom of the universe being compacted at the centre and the atoms of the original ball rarefying outwards, you may have his Rosa Mystica. At any rate, you can understand that the further out you go, the more you look at the same thing no matter in which direction you look like every direction being south from the North Pole. So you might as well say that you are looking at a centre when you have reached the periphery and look farther out. For the purposes of analogy, I suppose. He was still bitter. For the purposes of making it clear what I want you to do. I want you to turn inside out. I want you to be God, so to speak, for a few minutes. Indeed. Indeed. For those minutes, at least, you have done with searching for him further and further out, where you must have thought he was, and he is, of course, or you'd probably have been a nuclear physicist or a cytologist like myself. Consider yourself, then, the deity of yourself, your body, of each personality-packed cell within it. 
Those cells respond more or less well to your purposes and your plans. You love them all, and they love you, whether or not they know it very well. Now, think back. How did you explain it to your baby incisor when it first felt the pushing of a second tooth underneath? That it was expendable? That it was no longer part of your purpose? I don't suppose I felt that I was accountable to my teeth, grumpily. But at any rate, your purposes had not changed, had they? I suppose not. Now listen closely, God. Suppose you actually told your teeth that you didn't need them any more, and your heart cells that had been contracting along so bravely, and your marrow cells that had been making blood, and your stomach, and your spleen. You told each and every cell that it was probably a good enough cell, but that really there was no purpose in their doing anything as you yourself had no purpose and probably didn't exist anyway. Then what? They'd go right on working. What a man tells his cells can't affect them, you know that. Truculently, as if to say, you can't fool me. They would begin to quit right then and there. A man might not be able to tell his cells much, but remember, a god can. Now let's go a step further in. Let a cell be God, and let its individual molecules be its creatures. And this God tells his creatures that it's all over. No more purposes, no more action, because there's no reason for it. What then? The molecules break down? Facetiously. Exactly. And the atoms disperse and the electron shells fall away, and what happens after that I'm hardly prepared to say. Hardly amusedly now. Now back to man as man, not God, for the next. While you and your eager predecessors were pushing outward to the stars, I and mine were exploring cells. And we found cells dying from simple lack of faith, or you might say, from an excess of faith in purposes which had been abandoned. Our God said so and so, they insisted, long after their God had revised his plans to such and such. Changeable gods do not interest me, boredly. I'm glad to hear it, I told him. That's fairly important. The discovery part of this investigation, however, is that man does act as a god to his cells, can tell them things, and know that they hear his still small voice. And among other things which man has to say to his cells is his promise of immortality to each and every one. That's going too far, I think, Father Philip objected seriously. The body dies. Man has a precedent, I said quietly. But, I added, you have just told me that it was a number of bodily deaths which destroyed your faith in all pattern and purpose. Is that comparable? Not only is it comparable, it is, you might say, one of the myriad identical petals of the mystic rose. And it is one I know something important about. You see, I have witnessed the immortality of the cell. That's my contribution to the journals, if not to the instruction of the world which doesn't read them. Oh, I know. Every cell that's alive is merely a daughter cell of one original cell, so that cell is immortal. I don't mean that at all, even though that's true. You might say that I mean I have seen the souls of dead cells in heaven. Incredulously. Through the projecting microscope in the basement? No, you don't see them with eyes or hear them with ears, I assured him. I thought not. But that doesn't mean they're not there. The first time was in a placenta from the garbage can. We had been culturing polio viruses and human placentas. Very interesting personalities viruses are too. And I'd been sent a whole placenta more than I needed. What can a mother tell a placenta which has been doing its work and is still in excellent shape just like that civilization in the Phoenix Nebula some two and a half millennia ago. Does she say, There's nothing more for you in time or space, the baby is born, I abandon you to utter nothingness? Very rarely, and even then she doesn't mean it. But the life does go out of the cells, and disperses to God, glorifying him in no uncertain terms. This is what I heard and saw, with a God-given perception which is not in my eyes and ears. You don't mean intuition, surely, he objected disgustedly. Let me put it another way with another question. With what ears do you hear the music of the spheres? You are too much the poet. I don't follow you. He was puzzled. To be very prosaic, then, 
How do you sense the turnover or change in energy level of the lone electron of a hydrogen atom in interstellar space? By deduction from whatever type of recording is made from a radio telescope. You have no physical nerve endings to sense this directly? Of course not. But you are quite sure, nevertheless, that so gross a creature as man be aware of so slight an emission of energy? Yes. And that what man can be aware of, God is also aware of. It follows, if God is aware at all. If there is a God, then, there wouldn't be much chance that he didn't know about such gross creatures as the men of the Phoenix. Excuse me, I've gone far afield. You said the radio telescope. Well, a few other doctors and I have been working on an instrument to measure cellular action currents, in living cells, of course, and I had added an auxiliary component which was supposed to find out what became of certain suspected possible energy emissions not accounted for or required by chemical processes in the cell. Where there's smoke, there's fire, you know, and where there's energy, there's apt to be more energy. And here was a nice piece of fresh dying tissue in beautiful condition. I put a tiny sliver into the infrascope, just as a young child will put anything that comes his way into his mouth for analysis, and I saw the scintillations on the plate which I knew signalled the ascent of the souls of the cells, the binding energies, one flash for each dying cell body, calculated later, one quantum of binding energy, one soul. And so they were gone, done, dissipated into your machine, souls no longer. Father Philip's sigh was one of infinite disappointment. Binding energy to light, light to mass maybe, and mass to energy again, or is there anything but energy in the final analysis? You astronomers profess to know something of this. Why is it then that when you bump head-on into life you suppose it to be mysteriously something else? Something capable of complete extinction, of contradicting the laws of the universe? But I digress again, I am sorry. I have not said what you are waiting to hear. Father Philip drew in a long breath. In a frenzy of spirit, I worked for months to refine the instrument and to make more precise the registering and recording, daily trying various tissues in the original machine, getting reacquainted too with the personality of various types of cells and the big projecting mic. Today I can show you, or any interested person, the endurance of personality in the energy quanta after the cell body is dead. Does this make a difference? Father Philip's sigh this time was a relaxation of his whole being. Somehow it does, he said. But I don't know why. You know, I assured him, that the crux of the phoenix matter was the question of personal immortality. If the souls of the phoenix folk are in the hand of God, what does it matter to you or me where their bodies are? Suppose, just before the end, God told them that he would bless their physical passing and set it for a sign to a younger people that their saviour was at hand. You have no way of knowing that he did not. You do know that he said, Other sheep I have which are not of this flock. And when your own body dies, you may even meet your beloved folk of the Phoenix Nebula, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Father Philip's hand reached out and I grasped it. He returned the pressure firmly. Thank you, Father, he said gravely. I have been in mortal danger of making a mistake. You have been sent to me. As you were sent to the crew of the expedition, and have not yet wholly failed them. How do you feel at this moment, in your body? His look became abstracted, and he seemed to be searching himself internally. Then he looked back at me with a shade of a grin. My incision itches like fury, he said, and I need the bedpan. So you are healing already? Now try to tell me a man can say nothing to his cells. I drew back the sheet and observed the drying of the serum at the edges of the incision. How soon can I get out of here? he asked eagerly. I must go to the other members of the crew at once. First to confession, I reminded him. And then, depending on God's will, it may be weeks or even days. I cannot predict the speed of a miracle. And it was well I did not try. It was a scant ten hours later that the figure of Father Philip Burt was wheeled in a chair to a waiting ambulance that was to take him to the first of the hospitals where a member of the crew lay in desolate quarantine. His body was still frail, but his smile was of radiant health. 
he waved to me. One flock, he called, and was borne away. Thanks for listening. Hitting the like button helps the channel grow, so it would be much appreciated. And to go a step further, consider my Patreon. There you can get exclusive novelettes, early access to full novels, and ad-free audio and video versions of all stories. If you're wondering what to listen to next, I recommend my compilation of five wistful and winsome sci-fi short stories. A link to that video is on screen now.